Welcome back to our community. Susie Thomas with Tessa Compton and David Warther from David Warther Carvings and Gift Shop. A uh, pretty exciting event coming up. Let's just give a recap of everything happening. Yes, we are going to be hosting the Pomerine Hospital Auxiliary 7th Annual Christmas Tree Festival. We'll be opening our doors November 7th through 12th from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we are thrilled to kick off the holiday season, giving folks the opportunity to come in, possibly buy an already pre-decorated, themed, a holidayed out tree, <laughs> uh, and they could buy it that day. No silent auction. You can buy it outright, or you can just come in and enjoy the festive mm-hmm. decorations. Get ideas for your own home. So, uh, really, our doors are opened for anyone and anyone who wants to come in and get a taste of the holiday season. I love that. Also, wreaths and centerpieces. So it's not oh, yes. just trees. Oh yeah, they're small items, large items, trees that are six feet tall to trees that are for a tabletop. So there's a little something for everyone. No one has to have an empty looking house at That's all. That's right. It's Christmas. kind of like bringing Pinterest to life. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is crazy then. Yes. I'm getting the idea of what these look like. Oh, it's amazing. One tree last year had a giant um, head of a snowman on it and then the tree itself was the snowman. Other oh trees goodness. looked like elegant ball gowns. Uh, so it's amazing the plethora of creativity that people are putting into these to these items. And I love what you said. Maybe you're not in the market for a tree per se, but you get an idea of how to decorate it a little differently well, this year. Well, absolutely. And you get to come to our museum without an admission cost. So we are just asking on behalf of the auxiliary a suggested donation of $5 a person. But none of that's going to the museum. It's going all to a good cause to update and uh, modernize Pomerine Hospital and whatever updates they need throughout the year. And if you're just tuning in, this is to um, benefit, it's the seventh annual Pomerine Hospital Christmas Tree Festival taking place November 7th through 12th, and it's at David Wore the Carvings and Give Shop, So, which is always an awesome place to visit. Let's talk about what you find there the rest of the year. Well, the rest of the year, you can tour our exhibit. We actually have now... Now, 84 carvings. <gasps> it used to be 83, but David has just completed a new you carving. You made a new one. I yes. Sure <laughs> and it was amazing to watch. I got hired on to the team about a year ago, and I got to watch this carving from stage one and to now being in the museum. And it was just an incredible process to see. But that's what people get to experience. They get to see his workshop, learn about David's techniques, and see really in one place the entire, almost entire life's work of one artist, which is rare. Yeah, you don't often get to see that. And that he's still living, and that he's still young. Yes, only, well, we won't say your age, David. <laughs> Thank you. But, but you know, you're not a hundred year old man. My wife here. keeps me looking young. <laughs> you what is it like growing up Warther, David? Oh, it's it was kind of fun. Um, my grandpa I was alive and well when I was a kid, and he was quite a character. And he was very inspirational. He was a person that really encouraged other people in ev- anything they had an interest in. I took an interest in carving for when I was little, and Grandpa really did a lot to encourage my work. And he was okay that they were boats and not trains, huh? He was. He was, he was fine by that. <laughs> Where did you get that interest in ships and the, the history of ships? Well, I started off making ships when I was a little kid really because I thought they were, they were very pretty. I liked the be- beauty, the grace of the ship. And I really hadn't given any thought much to the ship itself, that is the history. But then as I got into high school, being a history buff, I started delving into the, the, the genesis of the ship. And we find out that the ship goes all the way back to 3200 B.C. And once I really realized the, the scope, the, the depth of the ship uh, in time, I decided to, to make it a project to carve the history of the ship. And that's really what I've been doing. And that's why there are so many. They, they cover 5,000 years of, of shipbuilding starting on the Nile River in Egypt and coming up to modern-day sailing ships. 84 different ships. This represents how many years of your life that you've dedicated to doing it? Well, I actually made my first major carving that was on scale from blueprints when I was a senior in high school. And I'm 57 now, so it's been 40 years. But you've been cranking out more than one a year because you're not 84. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's impressive. Well, thank you. I average making two ships a year. 
Tell us about the most recent one. The most recent one is a really pretty ship called the Newsboy. The Newsboy sailed out of New York in 1853. It was a really small, really fast cargo ship, not a passenger ship. And it was actually, in its time, it was actually the FedEx of of the shipping world. You could expect to put your cargo on the Newsboy in New York Harbor, and you could expect it to be unloaded in London two and a half weeks later, which back then was unheard of. This ship was just a fast ship. Hmm. I wow. guess that's their version of overnight shipping. I get, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. In 1854, that was as as good as it got. 1854 <laughs> style overnight. Yes. What did you say? A couple weeks. Usually, about two and a half, three two weeks half, would three put weeks. put that ship from New England into uh, anywhere, any most of the ports in Europe at that time. It actually ran on a on a on a run that was called the Triangular Trade, and this was a trade route that a lot of American shipping merchants were utilizing. They would load their cargo in New York or, or Boston in one of the New England cities. And this was back when America was manufacturing a lot of equipment, a lot of tools, a lot of different things people needed. They'd load a ship up like this with all that cargo, sail over to Europe, have it all sold, unloaded. Then they would reload the ship pretty much with wine and oils and fruits, and then they would haul all of those goods to the Caribbean. In the Caribbean, all those goods were sold, and they would load the ship with sugar, molasses, and rum, and they would head to the Ameri- to America again. So that's what we were in the market for. Sugar, molasses, and rum. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> While they made their tools. Yeah, <laughs> right. so, Oh, my goodness. So that triangular trade ran um, for many, many decades, and, it, and it's really what brought a lot of wealth to American shipping own, ship, ship owners. Mm-hmm. Where do you find out all this information? I guess, yay, Internet, right? Oh, actually, some. Um, A lot of my research is done uh, with different scholars and museums in Europe who uh, have a lot of blueprints. Now, this was was an American ship, so it was different. But a lot of my ships are actually ships that sailed in the old world because, of course, that's where things started and got a a, a headwind there for the first few thousand years. So I I work with a lot of different museums and underwater archaeologists and scholars to get the blueprints in. Explain again how you're able to get a blueprint of something that existed so many thousands of years ago. Well, a lot of these um, a lot of these ships that were made thousands of years ago are actually found. Um, a number of different people buried ships with themselves, starting with the ancient Egyptians. And when people hear that the ancient Egyptians buried ships, most people think, okay, they found two or three ships. They have found many hundreds. Really? Yes, and they, they can't even get them all out of the ground. Most of them are still in their original graves, never even been cracked open. And not buried at sea, buried under the ground. Right, buried in, in, in graves just like you would bury a, a pharaoh. Huh. Uh, these were buried in underground graves and cliffs and so forth. Um, and this was a way that they did things. If you could afford it in the ancient Egyptian world, you buried a ship with you. If you could not afford that, if you were not a king or a prince or a wealthy merchant, then you had a model of a ship buried with you. And if you were a poor person, you actually would have a a picture of a ship buried with you. Really? So everyone in Egypt went to the grave with a ship because they had a pagan belief that you needed to have a ship in the next life. So that's why everyone had a ship. So we find these ships today. Archaeologists, Egyptologists find the ships, the models, the paintings, the artwork. And they, they do a lot of research to composite this information and, and develop blueprints of what ships look like at those times. And you've developed relationships with these people, these scholars and so forth. They know when they're hearing from David Warther that uh, you're the real deal. They, they will share information with you. Well, I don't, think, I don't think they think that so much as they just want to get that crazy guy in Ohio <laughs> out, from, out from underneath bugging them, I think. <laughs> And so, <laughs> You've developed some very cool techniques to do what you do. Can you share a little bit of that with us? Well, uh, what I get the most questions about are the, the rigging lines that I rig exactly. the ships it with. It looks like little threads. Well, they, they are small. I, I work ivory down to the size of, of uh, well, down to seven thousandths of an inch in diameter, which is about twice the diameter of a human hair. So it is ivory. It's not a thread. Right. It is antique ivory. It's elephant tusk ivory that, that came into the country years ago. That's how it's legal to work in that material. And I start off with raw material. I start off with an elephant tusk, a billet of ebony, which I buy from Kime Lumber, actually. <laughs> they import exotic wood. So I, I, I go five miles to 
time lumber to, to <laughs> pick up that. That's handy. And, and so from these raw materials, I then, then fashion the ships. And it takes you, if you do two a year, six months to do one? On average, that's been the case. Tessa, um, how fun was it to watch something start from go from start well, to finish? I was looking for something new every day. <laughs> Uh I would come into the workshop, and sure enough, there'd always be some new small piece that David was working on. And it was a slow process. You know, you're not going to come into our museum and see him complete maybe an entire mast or something, you know, in 15 minutes. But um, it was it was it was it was amazing to watch and and inspiring to watch someone. um, Well, what I like to tell guests is talent only gets you so far. It takes perseverance and commitment. And so to watch someone in this day and age stick to something for so long without Mm -hmm. losing a fascination and and persevering through the tough parts and the easy parts, um, it's just inspiring to watch. It helps you remember to do that in your own life and in many circumstances. Yeah, that seems like just a good life lesson. It is. David, would you say that, that this hobby that you have has aided you in life in other ways as well? Never thought of it that way? I I guess I just don't know what to think about that. (laughs) I think that's something the audience derives themselves, Uh I suppose. (laughs) And then you say, well, yeah, that takes some perseverance. How closely do you follow the blueprint then? Or do you have to envision something? When you start at something, I've been told you're supposed to start with the ending in mind. You imagine it or envision it as finished as you get started? Well, actually, I do. Um, when I when I start a ship, I, I first study the blueprints. And some ships are very simplistic. Others are very complex. But I've always made a point of, of being able to think in terms of the deck plan of that ship. In other words, the deck plan of the ship is as familiar to me as the deck plan of my own home or mm. the, the floor plan of my home. You just know where things are, and you start working to that end. When, when you ask about whether I'm able to stick to the blueprints, absolutely. There are some ships, however, especially in the ancient world, where we, we know there were variations in deck arrangement. And so there are times when I have some artistic license to, to go in and change things from what we see in a blueprint because we know there was perhaps a, a hatch on this ship. Its exact location could have been several different places. So I have the liberty of of making some changes. Whereas on a ship like the Newsboy, which sailed in 1853, the blueprints are there. You're not moving stuff around. (laughs) We can't wait to see this newest one, and we can't wait to see these Christmas trees and wreaths and centerpieces and whatever you're working on now. So (laughs) um, Tessa, give us all the final details one more time. Yes, it's November 7th through the 12th, uh, running Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And of course, there's no admission charge uh, to go through our museum. You get to see the trees and the ships uh, for a suggested donation of $5 and benefit a great cause. Awesome. Tessa Compton, David Warther, thank you for all you do in our community. Thank you.